This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And when I did go there, my father actually grabbed me by my wrist and threw me on the table and I quickly closed my eyes and I was raped continuously by each person in that room. And it lasted for hours and it wasn't like a rape it was more of an attack it was very vicious I was being bitten I was being slapped I was just being thrown around like a rag doll so school I was either punched kicked spat upon my hair was pulled I was called names um, because I was one of two people of color and the other person was my brother so if it wasn't him being beaten at lunchtime it was my turn Mother and father-in-laws would pour petrol over a girl, a bride, set her on fire and then say that she'd committed suicide because she was giving birth to a girl and they didn't want girls, so they thought she was a girl-making machine. So they would go kill her and then bring somebody else in or get somebody else married to their son and hope that he would uh, have an heir, he would have a boy. Um, And I was paranoid of fire. I just felt it was my turn coming up because I hadn't had a child. I was starting to push my father-in-law off me as opposed to just allow him to do things because I was repulsed by him, you know, I didn't want that. You know, you turn up to work, your ankles are bleeding because he would tie me up with, I don't know if you remember, the old metal coat hangers are really quite rigid. He would tie them around my ankles and the, sorry, and the metal bits would actually dig into my skin, but they would strip me as a way of a control thing to humiliate me. I became homeless because of domestic violence. My ex-partner tried to kill both me and my youngest son. I get 40, uh, roughly 30 to 40 death threats every month. And boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Nina Alk. Nina, pleasure. Lovely to meet you. Yeah, lovely to meet you. Book offer, kind of, you know, mind coach, life coach, whatever you want to call it. We also want to touch on honour killings yeah. as well, which is very important. I never really knew much about it, if I'm honest. But obviously, I knew you were coming on. I started doing a little bit of digging, and I even spoke to an undercover police officer, a woman. She said it's so rife as well. Especially in Scotland. Yeah. But why is that? As this is the communities stick together, and there's a big Asian community in Scotland, a lot of Pakistani communities, a lot of it, um, North Indian communities. Um, so things never change when they don't integrate and they withhold the traditional values and belief systems um, because they're in that community. Mm-hmm. Before we get into it, Nina, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, sure. get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. So I'm Nina Olk. I'm a mindset coach for UFC fighters and some really lovely people, but I value my work more so as an activist. Um, I'm very raw and real and people either like it or they don't. And often people say I should come with a trigger warning. So maybe your listeners want that. But the only warning I believe I should come is that I'm armed with love, complete self-love, which I like to hand out to everyone I meet. Um, So my story goes back to I'm born in 1970, so I'm 53 now. And um, it goes back to being born in Leicester. My parents are from North India. They're Punjabi and they 
brought with them very much their own self beliefs of how life should be le- lived. You know, like when you go on holiday, you pack your sun creams and your swimmers. But for them, it was all about taking their values and understanding how they lived their lives in India and bringing that forward. And that's how they raised us. And I was the youngest of three. How were you at school? So school, I was either punched, kicked, spat upon. My hair was pulled. I was called names um, because I was one of two people of colour. And the other person was my brother. So if it wasn't him being beaten at lunchtime, it was my turn. Um, I was a really dirty child because I was neglected by my parents. So I would turn up often covered in dirt and smell, really, um, which didn't help with getting picked on. But I loved school, strangely, because it was my escape through books that I found me in a way. So I would really absorb the learning process. I would try to please the teachers. I would sit right at the front. I would take books upon books upon books home. Um, and just lose myself because I wasn't allowed out of my room at home. From the age of six, I was literally told to stay within those four walls. But I enjoyed my solitude, if I'm being honest, because that's what I knew. So you being at school, did you think you were getting the love from the teachers, especially being the, the good of two-shoes? Because they were always loved by the teachers, always do what they're told, always getting top grades. Did, is, do you think that was a pattern for you to be good because you were getting that love that you weren't getting at home? Not really, because back then teachers were quite strict. They weren't as loving or empathetic as they are now. You know, they didn't show emotion. Um, You know, you were told off more than you were told that you were doing well, so to speak. You were never really rewarded. So I didn't really have many teachers that I connected with either because they weren't of my culture, so they didn't really get me. And I think being of a different culture, it was it was that difficult child, you know, the one they didn't want to deal with or they didn't want to understand. But they could have many a time have changed my life if they had taken some interest i've got to say you look great for and you're someone in their 50s what if you're doing is working like it's, you look someone in your 30s genuinely like you look great so well done like, so when did you realize that something was amiss like in your when you were six years old if you were kept in the room like was it just the norm or did you realize that like, there's something just not quite right here yeah i didn't didn't le- um, learn about the fact it wasn't normal until later on if i'm being honest i my job was literally to, when they would call me, they were I was non-verbal, so I didn't speak to my parents. We weren't allowed to make eye contact like we are now. Um, it was a case of always looking down, never speaking to somebody, looking at their faces. So my hearing um, ability was impeccable. I could hear them moving. I knew who was moving, who was coughing, who was sneezing. I could tell which person had opened the door because of the way they pulled it after they'd opened it. Um, so I didn't have a very good connection with my family in that respect. But um, I was always called out of my room to cook. That was the main reason I was called out because I was the only person that cooked in the house and cleaned. And um, one of my jobs was to cook for my parents. My dad, when he would come back from the pub, he would go away like, you know, most most guys go to a pub on a Friday or Saturday night and they bring back, then they used to bring back a lot of their friends. And he used to bring back an array of people, you know, some tall people, short people, whatever they were, but they were his friends and they were of the same culture And in my culture, we don't say somebody's name if they're older than you. You say auntie or uncle, but they're not related. It's just how we say, you know, our show respect. And um, I knew things were terribly wrong when I came downstairs one day. I was exceptionally tired. I was 14, just turning into a young woman, I guess. Um, And my mum used to wake me up by poking me, never sort of telling me anything. And that night, I really didn't want to come downstairs. I didn't want to cook any rice. I didn't want to make any curry, but I knew I had to. I had no option. And I sort of pulled myself out, came down the stairs, and they were exceptionally loud. And that's the first thing I remember coming down the stairs thinking, they're really loud today. They're, you know, I could hear the glasses. I could hear, see the bottles outside because my dad would place, once he'd finished a bottle, he'd place it outside. Um, and I could see all the bottles lined up thinking, God, oh, they're really drinking a lot today. So I made lots of food. My job was to take it on a big tray. I think the tray was bigger than I was back then. And um, I would place it on a low table and then I would leave. And that was my job. And then I would sit on the bottom step and wait. And normally they were quite quick at eating, but this time they were taking forever and I was trying not to fall asleep. But something really instinctively was telling me to just not go in that room that night. And I talk about it a lot where we have that inner messaging service because I now believe we're spiritual beings trapped in like a bodysuit and our spirits are telling us this isn't good for you. Don't go there. But I had to. What what could I do? I had no option. 
And when I did go there, my father actually grabbed me by my wrist and threw me on the table and I quickly closed my eyes and I was raped continuously by each person in that room and it lasted for hours and it wasn't like a rape, it was more of an attack. It was very vicious, I was being bitten, I was being slapped. I was just being thrown around like a rag doll. How the fuck do you deal with that now? Like how? Like obviously I can see the emotion in your face. I've got a daughter at 12 and I do everything in my power to protect her. I'm overprotective. I speak to enough people to understand how dark and demonic this world is. So when you go through that at six years old, like not knowing even what that is, then I had a, an amazing woman on called Della Wright. She went through the same sort of ordeal at six years old, her abuser, her mum used to go out and drink and he was her babysitter and this went on for many, many years and the strength of this woman has got is unbelievable. The strength for you sitting here to able to talk about this stuff and try and raise awareness and still try to show love says everything about your character and it shows you how far you've came in life and I take my heart off to you and I'm, I'm proud of you that you, you still manage to speak and start, still manage to be a better person because that stuff can make people turn fast, hate, rage, anger, no doubt you'd have had all that at some points in your life but to be sitting here looking great and trying to get on with life is, is an amazing thing and it shows what people can do with setting that mind and just want to be better and, and, improve, and improve which is so important in life. So after that experience then like, as a kid like, how do you move on from that? Do you become numb to the world? Is it like, what's How hard is that to then try and I don't know, forget, remember. So like, I was 14, I wasn't six. So went, from uh, from six, mm -hmm. I'd started this process of being the servant, like mm -hmm. a modern day slave, um, which I understand now. I didn't understand it then. But when I was 14 and this had happened, I lost myself. You know, I think all of us go through some things in life where we just can't cope. Um, and I'm no different to anybody else in that sense. I struggle to get up. I struggle to go to school. I was actually in pain because that kind of um, attack, as I call it, that kind of rage that they were abusing me with left me for months. It didn't go away. It wasn't just an overnight thing. You know, I was hurting for ages after I wasn't able to sleep. I was having nightmares. You know, I would wake up in the night without anyone to go to for comfort. And my room was bare. It literally was just a bed, no bedding, nothing. Um, and only comfort that I had was my dog. We, we had had a dog and she was my first sort of sense of warmth in my life because my parents weren't tactile at all. So I struggled and I remember not sitting at the front of the classroom at school. I would sit at the back and often I'd be curled up in a ball crying, but I was ignored because I was like, just, you know, just leave a be sort of thing. I think once a teacher asked me to get out of the room, um, but never asked me how I was. The girl that I walked to school with, I stopped walking with her. You know, I had a, a little girl that would walk to school with me and she used to teach me songs because I wasn't allowed to watch television. So she would say, we had this song on top of the pops and I'd be waiting for the Friday for her to tell me. But I stopped asking her and I stopped talking to her, but she didn't really know what to say to me. And I think I was a real siren for help. I was literally sending out all these signals, but nobody was picking them up. And then I realized I was pregnant. And I had to tell my mother and I was 15, you know, I was turning 14, 15 when all of this happened. And they took me to a clinic where they um, obviously arranged for an abortion. And I remember that was the first time I'd ever encountered kindness because after the procedure, I remember everything very clearly. But the one thing that I remember the most, and I've said it time and time again, is somebody actually touched my hair. She brushed my hair back and she gave me a cup of tea. And I thought, how bad of a person can I be that she's giving me this cup of tea, that she's extending this gift to me? Who am I? You know, my parents had always told me I was evil, that I was bewitched, I was a bad spirit, I was possessed by the devil himself. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons they hated me so much. But here was this woman actually touching me. And I remember taking that kindness and thinking to myself all the way back, I can't be that bad. And I kept, I've i got a habit of talking to myself. I've done it as a child, maybe not having anyone else to talk to. Some people have imaginary friends. The only friend I ever had was somebody called Fear, who literally followed me around everywhere I went from a young age. But I started to tell myself, maybe I'm not that bad. But on the way home, all my parents kept saying was, what are we going to do with her? She spoiled herself. 
you know, and, and you need to tell your daughter, as you said, you've got a daughter over and over again that she's tall. She'll believe that she is tall. I was being told that I was a problem, that their lives were terrible now, that people were going to laugh at them and I wouldn't be able to have an arranged marriage because I wasn't a virgin anymore. And what was going to happen? And I hated myself. Sitting in the back, I looked at my, the back of my mum and the back of my dad and I was really scared. I was really upset and I just hated me. You know, many a times at school, I'd wished I was that white boy or that white girl and not this Indian girl that was trapped in this disgusting body that everyone hated. Many a time I wished I was the teacher or somebody else. And I just didn't like me very much. I hated myself to a point where I wanted to kill myself. Um, and a couple of days later, after we got home from that, I took an overdose. And back then we had tubs of paracetamols, not packets. And I had the whole lot. Didn't know what I was doing. But if anyone's ever done that, they'll know you go through a lot of pain, abdominal pain, chest pain. I actually didn't know what to do. I took them, lay down thinking that would be it. Um, but I didn't die, obviously. I'm still here to tell the tale. How many times did that happen to you? The event that happened in the living room? Was that the one time? It was just the one time. Things progressed very quickly after that time that they wanted to get rid of me. It was almost like they wanted to get rid of their problem, which was me. And um, all I could hear my dad saying continuously was, what are we going to do with her? You know, that's all he would ever say. And then one day I heard him on the phone because I used to have this habit of really pressing my ear against the door. And it was like a really wooden coarse door because those days doors weren't nicely polished the way they are now or painted. Um, and I remember the splinters actually sometimes catching in my hair. But I remember listening to a conversation and he was talking to someone and saying, I'm really happy now oh my God, this is amazing. And I thought, I wonder what's happened that he's so happy. Because I was used to days and days and weeks and weeks of him complaining. And I was called downstairs. And when I went into the room, there was one of the guys that had raped me, you know, my father's friend. But with him was his wife. And they had a, a bag, like a bag um, with a tray in it. And the tray had sweet Indian sweets. It had like a, a red... Um, like a chiffon scarf that you put over my head because it was a ceremony that was taking place for an engagement and by them doing that they say we'll take your daughter but what I didn't know was who I was marrying or what was going on because he had a son that was a similar age to me um, and then while sitting there listening to it I realized that his son had a girlfriend who was white British and because they didn't want the community to know about this relationship he had, they were marrying him off to me in a sham wedding, but he would have nothing to do with me. We wouldn't share the same bed. We wouldn't share the same room. We would have nothing to do with each other. I was actually getting married for my father-in-law so that he could have a sex slave and my mother-in-law so she could have a servant. And they were making this agreement and money was exchanging hands. My father was saying, not that much. And he was saying, no, I want this much money. My father was saying, well, I won't give you this much gold. And he was saying, no, I want this gold and I want this for myself. You know, and there was this bartering going on over me. And then the next thing I knew, I was turning 16 and I was getting married. Um, and I ended up in their marital home, which was a lot smaller than my parents. They were a lot poorer than my father. They gave me a tiny little room, which was like a cupboard. And it had like a, a makeshift bed um, with no door and just almost like an open cupboard where I was going to sleep because it was downstairs and they would all sleep upstairs. And I knew after a little while that he was going to keep coming and bothering me. My father-in-law and I constantly for four years was pulling either his hands out of my underwear or pushing him off me. And I was a feeble young girl, really. I wasn't very old at all, but they wanted me to work. They were greedy for money. And that was their biggest mistake because I was ambitious in the sense of, I wanted to earn a lot of money because I thought if I earn a lot, they might leave me alone. So I didn't know what I was doing, but I discovered I was this other person in work. I was a more confident person. I gave myself the name Nina. It's not my name. And I would turn up at work and I would say, hi, everyone, you know, and be super cheerful and try to almost switch off what was going on at home because I didn't want to take that to this place. It's like if I've had a problem now getting it because I did go on the wrong train and my train was delayed as well. I've not brought that with me. I've left it there. But I could do, and you'll have a lot of problems with people where they bring their, their feelings with them wherever they go. But I had this way of understanding how not to do that. And I would turn up at work every day, super smiley. I was one of the youngest people that worked there. I was the only person of colour, and I learned to hang around in the right places, which was the coffee machine. 
on the executive floor, which was two floors up. And everyone said, never go there, never go there, never go there. And I thought, why? I want to go see what's going on. And um, one of the executives came came towards me, he was a marketing guy. And I said, oh, don't really know what I'm doing, but I really want a coffee and just smiled. And he said, what is it you're after? You know, and I said, a job. <laughs> he said, I thought you wanted a coffee. And he actually gave me, I was the first manager who was under 20. I think I was 17, actually, when I got the job on a really, really good wage, um, which I thought was going to please them. But nothing seemed to please them. But through work, I came across some people that said to me, this isn't the way your life should be. You know, you turn up to work, your ankles are bleeding because he would tie me up with, I don't know if you remember, the old metal coat hangers are really quite rigid. He would tie them around my ankles and the, sorry, and the metal bits would actually dig into my skin, but they would strip me as a way of a control thing to humiliate me, to scare me. But I was scared. I wasn't going to go or ring anyone. We didn't have mobile phones. The only phone was in the front room and I was too scared to go and ask anyone for help. Who was I going to ask? We don't call the police. We don't do that in our culture. So they would do these things to try and control. So see, when you were at work, was that, I know when you said you were at school, it was an escape. Was work your escape? You could be who you wanted to be and nobody knew what was going on behind closed doors? Yeah, I did. you've definitely hit the nail on the head. That was an escape. It was somewhere where I could learn more about me. And you know, when you grow up, you start to learn about things that you, you're always told by your parents what you are. You're always told by people what you are, but you start to discover new things. It doesn't mean you accommodate to them or you receive them, because if you're told not to receive them, you block them, but you do see them. So I did see things. I saw people. I, you know, I, I made friends. I never had friends, but I actually started to make friends with people. Um, and two of them that were significant for my my life changing, I guess, was um, a guy who was from Nigeria. He was working there and a girl who was Indian, just like me. Um, and they came a little bit later after me. And, and she was the one that said, you know, you should go back home because surely your parents won't do anything now. You're 21 and you're continuously coming here with more and more bruises or they could see that I'd been I'd been beaten. People can tell. Um, and I started to think maybe that was the right thing to do. Did you ever think about running? Or were you too scared? Where was I going to run to? Who would want me? You know, I was just a girl. I was born this girl that had absolutely no self-belief. I saw myself as a, a heavy baggage. I, I felt I was like this heavy bag. If anybody wanted to carry this bag, they won't be able to carry me. And nobody, I just felt nobody wanted me. I never ever was seen in that way. Or, you know, like you admire a woman or you look at her in a certain way that you think she's pretty. I never got those looks. I never did. I was just Nina, you know, Nina that would get on with it or Nina that was the manager. I just didn't ever, maybe I didn't see it, but I, I just felt I didn't get it. See, in the night in the living room, sorry to go back there, but see when you were 14, was your dad involved as well? My father was the first person to rape me. What a sick bastard. Huh? And your mum was there? My mum was upstairs. Um, people say, do you think she knew, she knew maybe she'd been um, treated badly, you know, in her past? What you have to understand is when you're a girl born into my culture or culture similar to mine, whether you're in the Middle East or you're in Africa, you don't matter. You know, we're very much almost disposable people. When we're not even people to them, we're just beings. Sad though. Does religion play a big part in this? Religion hasn't got anything to do with it. A lot of people confuse the two. What's the difference? Culture is how we live our lives. Culture should be about music. It should be about clothes. It should be about food. But unfortunately, cl um, culture is very much about how we live our lives, what we accommodate, who we allow to, are allowed to marry. Arranged marriages are a common thing. If you want to marry somebody, you can only marry somebody from your culture, from the same sort of northern India. You can't marry somebody from even South India. It's not allowed. It's taboo. It's crazy what we live in a world. For me, everybody's got their own beliefs and opinions on religion. For me, religion divides the world. If you look at religion, and some people can go to religion, they're the best people in the world. They, it's everything everything you perceive or whatever you want to take it but if you go deep into whether it's the Quran whether it's the Bible or some dark demonic shit in there the, you've got the Bible where you've got I think it was lots it was called where he got his two girls his two daughters pregnant when they were drunk they got him drunk and then you've got the Quran like Muhammad I think he was married at seven or girls at seven like, no matter what you say no matter if this was accepted 1500 years ago or thousands of years ago it's 2023 that shit should not be accepted 
Let's try to bring the age of consent down from 16 to 12 as well or 14. Again, kids, they're not old enough to make those decisions to be sexually active in my own mind. Maybe it's because I've got a daughter and I'm more protective, but the way the world is, it's sexual energy exchange as well. You've got soul ties, you've got so much deep and in-depth of energies and how it exchanges in life. And for me, people just need to wake up. I believe people can be brainwashed easy, whether that's culture. That ain't That ain't a culture beating kids and raping kids, that ain't a culture, that's paedophilia, no matter what way you look at it, no matter what religion says that, as a human being, you've got right and wrong, and you know, deep inside, like, as cheesy as it is, love is the answer for anything in life, for pain, to trauma, for happiness, that like, you, if you truly, I don't think enough people on this planet love themselves, including myself, like, I struggle, no matter what I do in life, no matter how successful I become, I still struggle, and I think, I ain't good enough, so I'll sit or I'll eat or I'll hibernate and I'll I'll get myself down. But then what happens is the next day I'll go, right, James, just hustle again. Because what it does is stops the demons. It stops these loud voices in my mind. The voices are still there. They're just not as loud when I'm as active and keep trying to push forward. Like, do we all know the answers in life? I genuinely don't know. And I always say that on podcasts, there's not really a blueprint or manual how we should really be living life. As a human being, we're all kind of confused. We're all kind of wired up where... We don't genuinely know what created us, what put us here. We can all have different opinions and I'll listen to everybody's opinion on religion, whether they believe, whether they don't believe, if there's 4,000 gods, 5,000 gods or 4,000 different religions, who says what's right or who says what one is right? I just, I genuinely don't know. But for me, it's to, it's to question everything and take an understanding of people. But I've interviewed enough people with dark stories, with positive stories to understand nobody knows what the fuck is going on. We're just all kind of just trying to get through life from... And I know I can ramble a bit here, but it's just, I'm not daft. I see things as well. I feel things. I've got a good energy. I've got a good intuition. My soul's as clean as it can be just now. I believe in something internal that keeps us going in life. But all the stuff that you went through then, your dad, like, how was the other brothers and sisters in your house? I was the only girl. So you were the only girl. What about the, the boys? How were they treated? They were treated really well. But you see, I thought, I used to get happy when my mother was holding my brother, hugging him. When they were being celebrated, I was happy for them because my way of loving or understanding of love was that other people deserve love, that I don't. So I was happy when I was cooking for them because I would do my best to extend my love through that. So giving love was me. That's what I've always been about, giving that love. I just didn't understand that I always was love until now. What about your mum? Like when you when you moved out and stuff, were you still in contact with your mum and dad? No, in my culture, once you were married, you had nothing to do with your family. So I didn't speak to them before. Do you believe that's a culture? I believe it's the way of life they believe is the right way. It's like I always say to people, it's like if you um, ask me to build a house, I haven't got a clue. I can try and do it. I can try my best, but I'm not a builder. So I will do it to the best of my knowledge. So somebody else might come along and say, why did you do this? And why did you mix, you know, you didn't mix the cement right. And I'll be like, well, that's what I thought was the right way. So I've done, I've used what I've, what tools I've got to do the best job. I'm not condoning their behavior. I'm not saying it's right because it's definitely not. Um, but I believe they did what they knew and it's not right, but it's what they were doing. And I'm sure that it was done to other girls because I, I knew the other girls in the community. I knew they were treated as badly as I was. I don't know about sexual abuse because no one talks about it in my culture, especially it's a very taboo subject and people perceive you to be dirty if you do talk about it, but I don't see myself as dirty. I see myself as very clean. I know that the hands that are dirty are my father's foremost. What about your father-in-law? Was he raping you as well? Yeah, he he was con he was very sadistic with his rapes it was very um you know he would do th certain things that were very difficult especially with me being so young i found it very difficult to be around him is he still alive oh, they all still are alive yeah how does that then play in your mind that they're all still living like would there any be would there ever be convictions of those people a kid in in scotland raped a 13 year old girl in a park got community service how is that possible? So I've spoken at Scotland Yard. I'm going back there shortly. I've spoken over numerous um, 
political places like parliament and things um, to tell them that they're not doing anything, that they put up a poster saying, if you're suffering from domestic violence, come forward. And then they're telling you, you don't have enough evidence to press charges. I have gone to the Crown Prosecution with my complaint, I guess, um, against my parents, against my ex-partner, against my father-in-law and his family. And I've been told very much so that nothing can be done. So now I still want justice because I deserve that, you know, um, and I'm doing what I need to do um, to get it. And speaking about it and helping other people, that is using your pain and trauma as a, as a positive and that's the hard thing. It's, di it's difficult. I've, I've told the story over a hundred times now. Um, and I was saying the other day, it's like opening a, a wound. You literally reopen it, reopen it, reopen it. But through that pain, somehow the message gets across to people. They connect with it. They know that it's real. They feel it. And it might not even be the same kind of pain. They just know that it's real. So they come forward. And one of my videos went viral. I sent it to you. And I think it's on 21 million. And that was my 97th attempt to get this message of these things exist. Let's try to bring them to an end for gender-based violence, you know. Let's not have, every human should, for me, have basic human rights. They should be loved. They should be born to be free. And when that got that attention, I had, I now, up to date, I think I've got nine and a half thousand messages from people, not well-wishers, they're extra. These are messages saying, I don't know what to do. Your story is my story. I've had men come forward saying, I feel like I want to just kill myself because I can't get over what happened to me when I was a young boy. Or my mum and dad used to argue a lot with domestic violence because I suffered that too. So messages are really, really important. It's really important to keep it as it is, not to fabricate it, not to almost shrink it either, because my trauma is not your trauma, but it's pain, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, and we all struggle with, everybody's got different levels of trauma, but trauma is still trauma. You can have the smallest bit of trauma and still end up an addict, still end up suicidal. That you've got, that's the high end of it. That's the worst thing for me, imagine as a father to do that to his child. For many years at the start, I probably wasn't the best dad, but that's because I wasn't there. That's because I decided to party or take drink and drugs because I wanted to try and act like the big man. When really I was a weak man, I was scared, I was vulnerable, I didn't know how to be who I am now. And now I, I believe I'm a great dad. I do everything. Now I do everything for my kids. There's a, a selfish part of it. I do everything for myself, and that's okay because you've got to look after yourself. Because the bottom line is nobody really takes your hand to try and give you the life that you want you need to go out and get it yourself no matter what's fucking going on up here but so how long did this last then in that marriage how long did this go on the abuse it went on for four years i ended up going to work one day i decided i wasn't going home because the police were turning up around my area and it was not a nice part of leicester because that's where i'm from originally and they were turning up because brides were being burnt and it was um, a burning bride thing in the 90s which is very well known around the UK and Scotland, where mother and father-in-laws would pour petrol over a girl, a bride, set her on fire and then say that she'd committed suicide because she was giving birth to a girl and they didn't want girls. So they thought she was a girl making machine. So they would go kill her and then bring somebody else in or get somebody else married to their son and hope that they, he would uh, have an heir, he would have a boy. Um, and I was paranoid of fire. I just felt it was my turn coming up because I hadn't had a child. I was starting to push my father-in-law off me as opposed to just allow him to do things because I was repulsed by him. You know, I didn't want that. Yeah, that's that stuff, burning kids and raping people. And no matter, that ain't culture. That's psychotic fucking madness. That that's Every one of these men should be hung in front of everybody and, and made an example of, like I always say, they should bring back the death penalty for rapists because what happens is they can't change their mindset. Their mindset's too far gone. There's one in every fair that's got paedophile tendencies. One in every street. And all the stuff that gets took out, it's only a small percentage that get convicted. And if they do get convicted, they're either getting community service or 12 months and straight back out in the streets to convict again and to do bad stuff again. Like, the thing is, like, Russia, whether people believe in what's happening with wars, I don't know. I'm not 
that way in crime. But with Russia, for your paedophile, you get life in prison. Australia, you get your passport and your driving license took off and you can't change your name. In the UK, you can change your name for less than 20 quid. You can go and work in a different school. You can go and work in hospitals because the system doesn't then check. If you've changed your name, you can get a different driving license, different passport for less than 20 quid. Like, the system here is fucked. The system protects. Pedophiles. Pedophiles. That's because the people, the majority of elite are pedophiles themselves. Because politicians oh well, they've been caught again with a young boy but that's what politicians do right oh the person from church was caught raping a young but that's what they do right and we as a society in the uk say well that's just the way they are we don't stand up and say but this is wrong mm -hmm. let's make a change because we're quite spineless we don't like to you know we're very proper and we don't like to um cause a bit of a a, a problem because it's seen as a problem. I'm seen as a problem, which is why I take security around with me, because I have numerous death threats from the Middle East, from people in the UK, from mm -hmm. people in Asia, because I say it as I see it. And why shouldn't I? Because I'm being honest. Yeah, you become a target. And at the end of the day, we don't know what everybody's purpose is in this life. My job is just to let people tell their story, but I have opinions on certain things. Like, you become a threat. If I speak out as highly as I can, I become a threat. My voice is heard through millions of people each month. Of course, I become a threat. Like, I'll never back down or lie down because I believe in what I, I speak is what is the fucking right thing. You look at Jill Dando, apparently she was murdered because she was going to release a documentary on high-profile names. Do you know what I mean? Look at, you get the Philip Schofield now. His brothers just became fucking convicted paedophile. Philip Schofield, there's rumours about the T-boy as well, and, and he came out gay after 30 years and everybody's applauding him. What about his fucking wife he was lying to for 30 years? What about the lies and the deceit and all the other bullshit? Like, the thing is about the mainstream media, and especially BBC, we can talk about the statue outside where it was created by a paedophile. Why is that statue still there? Well, it's a known paedophile who, who made that statue. Like, the thing is, you go Jimmy Savile, you go Epstein, it goes so dark, and with these high-profile men, they've got so much money Money's not an object. No money's not a thing to them. There's, there's no meaning to it. So what do they do? You, you can go down the satanic route as well. We can really look into the dark shit with the drinking blood, the adrenochrome. Like, there's so much shit. You know, I, I don't have all the answers to it. I've never seen it. I just hear people talking about it. It can be a bit far-fetched. We think they're crazy, but it's the ones who are crazy are fucking telling the truth. And my eyes. So when you decided to go, enough's enough, where did you get the strength from to then... I believed my friend at work. I believed what she was saying was true. I was very... Did she um, know everything that was going on? No, but she knew that I was in a bit of a, a dangerous position because of the way I would turn up at work. Um, and I believed when she said that if you go home, your parents would love you because that's what I wanted to hear. Sometimes we just want to hear somebody say what we're thinking or we're wishing. And when I went home that day to my parents, I really thought they were going to pull me in and love me and say... You know, you're 21, it's okay now. And people say, why did you go back? It's the same place that you were raped, same place that you were treated badly as a child, same people that didn't care about you or see you for four years. Why would you go back there? But I don't even know the answer to that because I, would, I just had this ideology in my head and I was a bit away with the fairies anyway in the sense of in my dream world, in my little head, I wanted my mum to look after me and brush my hair like she should have done when I was a child, my father to hold me and say, he's going to protect me. And I just ended up doing the wrong thing, but I didn't know it until I was already there. Trauma bonding? It's just what you know, isn't it? It's all mm -hmm. I knew. And, and I was so obsessed, like they had created this person, this young child, because I was still a child, even at 21, I was very naive. I, I understood about how the community thought. If I went anywhere else, the community would completely cut my parents off. They would be looked on really badly. So... I felt I would save face if I did go back there and I could explain to them and maybe they would actually listen to me. I had this thing in my head that I had to go back there because being there was a lot better than being where I was and I had no other options at that point. Did you ever know your mum's upbringing? Not really, but her side of the family have actually reached out to me in a loving way. I decide not to speak to anybody because I don't want that connection anymore. Um, Are you still a threat towards, is your father still alive? Yeah, he's still threatening to kill me. Um, beheading is the highest form of retaining honour. Um, and he and my brothers are, well, one of my brothers have said they will do that. How can they call it an honour, Kellen? No, it's not, not, not honour in harming a woman, harming a child, harming 
killing someone it's the most weakest form of anything on this planet like where does the word honor come from i don't understand that no my um ted talks called it there is no honor in killing because there isn't you know the two words don't go together um but i'm not to say because i'm not that person i'm not them but it's wrong which is why i'm trying to raise awareness and i am raising awareness yeah, keep going, man. And anything I can help with, I'll always have your back. The thing about an honour killing is it's just a glorified word for attempted murder or murder, but you get lesser of a sentence because culturally they take into consideration that the person's culture has taken a part in their decision to harm that person. And my point to the police is that's a load of rubbish because they've tried to kill that person with the means to kill them. That's their intention. Their intention isn't to harm them. It's actually to kill them. My my attempted at honour killing was with the intention to kill. And so if somebody does an honour killing, then what's their sentence? Um, it's not life. It's not murder. It's not the same. And what about if it happens in India or Pakistan? Nobody or... does anything if it happens in India, which is why so many girls get taken out of school and disappear to India. And they you get told, well, she's gone to live with her auntie. Um, and, you know, there was a big hoo-ha where all these charities which i don't really believe in was saying you know it's great we've got the age change now in the uk you can't get married until you're 18 but they're just going to find another way they're going to send the girls away and i've had one recently come to me to my non-profit say to me i'm 15 they're trying to marry me to my cousin i don't want to get married to my cousin and i'm 15 i just want to be a midwife and luckily i helped her to escape and now she's with a foster family who are looking after her 100 miles over 100 miles away from where she was but the thing is, she would have been sent to where she was being sent to. Um, I won't say which part of the world it was. Married, forced to have children and brought back when she's 20 because they want to live in the British society. They want to live in a different country, not where they are, mm -hmm. because they can probably make more money possibly. But the point is, she would have disappeared and come back. And then even then, the British government are not going to say, hold on a minute. So you're the mother and you would have had this child at this age. That's wrong. They're not bothered. I don't care what anybody says. They do not care. What about arranged marriages? Like, what's the ages all around the world? I know, I think Nigeria or maybe 12, Iran Nigeria. Is, is very young. Yeah. Like UK is 16. But how can still people still get married here younger? UK has just changed to 18. Um, it has just changed as a law that's gone through. But with Nigeria, it's 12. Zimbabwe, it's 12. I work with two non-profits because I don't believe in doing things ourselves. We can't make that much of a change. But if we support one another, because it's not about me, it's not about my ego. It's about actually doing something that's of worthwhile to save others. So I work with a place in Zimbabwe. We keep girls in education. The reason the parents marry them off there is because they simply can't afford the education because you have to pay for it. So after 12, they have to pay. So what they do is they somebody will come along and say, I'll take your daughter and I'll give you two goats, which is a true. I, you know, I've interviewed the woman that set up the um, non-profit and her grandfather had bought a 12-year-old for two goats. And when she came, they were like, hold on a minute, how can we call her grandmother? We're 12 and she's 12. That doesn't make sense to us. But by retaining them in education, we then get them educated. They'll go work at a bank or in an office and they then look after the next girl, the next girl, and we change that cycle. So there is slow change, but for me, it's not quick enough. Um, but it's it's barbaric to think that a 12-year-old could be forced into marriage. I think younger as well. Where is it when you see these old men with young brides? Like, where is this? A lot of um, them are in the Middle East, um, the Middle Eastern countries like Afghanistan and those sort of places where they marry at six. They'll take a bride at six. Um, but a lot of the ones you'll never find because I was never a statistic and people like to work on statistics, but statistics are unrealistic. So those girls, you'll never hear about them because a lot of them would have died in childbirth. How bad are the honour killings and what possesses somebody for an honour killing? What's the things that someone has to do wrong in their mind to then kill their daughter? Is it majority of women the honour killings are for? Is it all women? Mainly women. Um, there have been some cases in Turkey where... Boys have come out that their uh, sexual orientation is not straight. So they've been killed for that reason. For me, it was because I was um, leaving an arranged marriage and I hadn't birthed a child and that I'd come back to my parents. So they tried to kill me because of that. 
It could be just because of what I'm wearing today. It could be because my hair's down, it's not tied back. It could be because somebody's showing um, an arm where, you know, they don't like you wearing sleeveless clothes or that I might be seen as flirtatious with you. You know, somebody could see the both of us together in a photo and, and that's not acceptable. So she should be killed because she's bringing shame to us. It's all about what other people think. This is the worst thing. It's about everyone else, not what you yourself think. It's how you're perceived by out, the outside world, by the people in your community. Mm -hmm. But what about your dad? Well, who was the six-year-old you were speaking about in one of the videos? Like, who was that? Your your sister or your cousin? Who was that about honor killing? Yeah. So, um, sorry, um, I became homeless in 2015. So we're jumping forward. Um, I became homeless because of domestic violence. My ex-partner tried to kill both me and my youngest son. Um, and the police came to find me. I was given a refuge, I guess, by a Christian lady. I know you don't believe in religion too much, but she's a sincere person. And I think just touching on religion, um, I've read every textbook that constructs itself as a religious text. And I, what I have taken from that is it gives you almost like a cheat guide of how you should live as a good person. But it's not the religion that you should be following. It's a way of life. And for me, my way of life is to be of service to others, to extend love, not to ignore people, to actually listen to people as opposed to just talk at them and just to be a good human being so that that can be a catalyst for someone else to follow my suit. Um, she took me in because I was homeless, as I said, and the police came to talk to me. And I thought it was my ex-partner making something up that I'd stolen something from him um, because the police were quite rubbish when it came to my situation. And they said they needed a character reference. And I said, a character reference for who? And it was a it was a lady policewoman. And she said, well, we've just come back from India. And I said, why did you go to India? What's this got to do with me? And she said, we need a character reference on your father. There's a case against him for abduction. And I was really confused because you can imagine I've gone through a real traumatic time of 23 years of domestic violence, finally leave. And suddenly I've got the police asking me about my father. And I said, well, I actually had a problem with my father when I was 21. He tried to kill me. And I did go to the police and she said, well, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about a six-year-old who's his daughter. And suddenly I realised I had this six-year-old little sister that I knew nothing about. And he had taken her because she was half Polish without the mum's knowledge and gone from here to Poland, from Poland to Romania to somewhere else and ended up in India and left her in India. This is what the police told me. And all I could think about is how scared she must have been because I know how scared I was at 21 months. My father's a very violent man. And my heart was breaking because by this time I've got my daughter, my two sons. I'm a mother myself. Um, and, and I was just in I was just in hysterical tears. And she said to me, look, we just need to know how he is, how he treated you. And I told her. And I said, why haven't you brought her back from wherever he's left her? And the police said, well, you know, we got there and we weren't allowed in the building. And it made no sense to me. And I said, well, tell me where it was. But she said, we can't tell you. And I did find out, you know, over time I found out because I started to, not deliberately, but the way the universe is aligned, it brings people into your life. And I became aligned with two non-profits. There were human trafficking non-profits. They were helping people that had come out of human trafficking, I got on board to help them with their mindsets because when you've been in a situation like I had been, you're brainwashed to a certain degree, like you said earlier, and you don't know how to do the simplest things like go to the shop. You know, I've only just learned to go to um, shopping centres because I was never allowed. I was kept in this bubble. So I really got them. So I started working with that non-profit and another non-profit in America who actually snatched children away from the traffickers, especially around Super Bowl times. And I asked them and I said, you know, my sister's been missing. Do you think it could be anything to do with human trafficking? Because when I Googled where she could have been left because I was getting bits of information from left, right and centre, I realised it was a religious place that he'd left. And now if you're a religious place or a religious school, you're protected by the politics of that country. So if you were to go there, you're not allowed in because you're from a different country. And I realised very quickly that the pieces started to come together and... To cut a long story short, I realised he'd sold her to traffickers where they harvest organs. And if they were weaker children, they would sell them to the UAE, the Middle East, as servants, as kitchen servants. And I had this 
horrible feeling in, in the pit of my stomach again that she wasn't here anymore. But I kind of tried to be optimistic and I realised that she's one of many. There are thousands of her that have been taken this way and sold for whatever reason. And I couldn't not do anything about it. So, sorry, she was the catalyst as to why I did my first talk, um, which happened to just end up being a TED talk. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Like, I know it must be difficult to speak about and open up these wounds, but if you're speaking out, then help so many because this will reach a lot of people. So it's a case of sometimes the cards that you've been dealt is because you're the only one that can play them. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of people wouldn't be sitting here and you've got every right to fucking try and end your life. It's not the answer, but you've got every excuse, not just one, but many. But it's a mad, mad story where you think, fucking hell, that... And the same with religion, like I said, I've got many Muslim brothers and sisters and they're the best people on the planet. When I'm home, when I'm in their house, their mum, they're cooking. It's unbelievable. Same as the Bible and I've done my homeless documentary and I go. I used to go to uh, meetings, gambling and stuff and a lot of people turn to Christ and they're the best people ever who genuinely want to help people. I genuinely believe as a human being we all look for guidance. We want something to believe in and if you're believing in something and it's for the, the right reasons, like I say, the Quran and the Bible have got so many positives from it but just a lot of dark shit in it as well where yeah. it, it doesn't really be spoke about enough if I'm honest we can speak about the positives but there's a lot of if the brain's a powerful tool you'll know this yourself that it absorbs anything it sees or hears and it, and if you're constantly getting fed that information then it's going to be normal like the majority of rapes on this planet are from white men as well that is I'm not saying religion's to blame but if you go down the, the church the amount of the billions they spend each year for the cover-ups of these paedophile priests and people it's just dark and like i say if you've got a religion or believe in something that like seeks as well i love their beliefs and what they do for the people and but just for me it's to try and think for yourself but if you're looking for guidance and if you've chosen a, a religion and it's making you thrive in life and making you believe in something you've got a higher power protecting you for me i believe there's a higher power out there i don't know what it is don't believe in one thing I, I don't i don't know what's created I, I don't know why we're here we've all kind of got our purposes in life but the stuff that you go then through that like, how do you then deal with that like, all that how do you then deal with trust because obviously you've came here as well like how, how's your trust that like, how do you function going through all that shit how do you even yeah, I mean, talk I've... to a man how do we even communicate where you seem on a level where you don't seem as phased like if i seen you walking by the street i would never think you went through the shit you've been through and that's the important reason I've never judged a book by its cover but how do you then deal with trust and talking to men it's really strange that isn't it because half of my clients most of my clients 90% of them are men um I feel I'm very maternal I know that I'm very I have this maternal energy that people always seem to feel better when they're around me and you know and I've been in situations where I mean my security is with me today where he's been with me and we've sat at a table and people I don't even know have just sat there and and they've forgotten that everybody else around them is there and they've just told me their deepest, darkest secrets and what's really hurting them, their traumas. And they've almost zoned everybody else out because I'm there. So I understand I have that ability to do that and to give people that safe space. My safe space is within me, I guess. I I didn't like me very much. Um, and I was forced to move from Leicestershire to where I live now, which was over... I think two to 300 miles um, because the police said to me, you know, we can't stop your ex-partner trying to kill you. Again, my parents started looking for me. So it was a case of me having to up and leave. And at the time I remember thinking, I don't really want to do this. Everything I've known is the country. I, I'm a country girl. I don't want to go to a city. I don't want to go somewhere where there's no green because I'm very much about grounding. Um, but I had to do it. And it was actually when I moved that I, because my son, sons went through a lot as well with their trauma, with mental health. And um, one of them had tried to kill himself. He'd actually got himself a one-way ticket to America, tried to buy a gun, hotel room was booked for one day, left me a suicide note and his brother a USB stick with lots of their memories from films. And um, 
I'd got him back, but I never got the right boy back, the same boy, because he changed. But we're not the same people we were yesterday. You know, we change, we progress. Um, he taught me a lot, I have to admit. He taught me that I didn't listen when he tried to speak to me. He taught me that I never asked him, how are you? All I was thinking about was, right, we've gone from homeless to having enough money to rent a house. Now I've moved, I need to get a sofa, I need to get um, a TV. But I never once stopped to say, what's going on with you? And often we just want to be heard, we want to be seen, we want to be present with that person. And there's so many voices that kept coming at all of us, you know, people from social services, I guess, the pharmaceutical people throwing, you know, try and take this drug, take that drug, through the doctors, to the point where there was too much noise. And I said to everybody, stop, we're going to move. I'm going to take him off the drugs. He's going to just have nothing but love around him with some foundations and some rules that where he can't go past. Don't throw the plates, don't do this. But I'm going to leave him alone because there's that much going on in his head. He can't hear himself. And I did the same for myself. I stood in the garden one day when I was grounding and I decided to switch the noise off, which is difficult because from a young girl, I've been told I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm worth nothing. But I said to myself, who do you want to be again? You know, like talking to myself the way I do. And I said, Nina, who do you want to be? And I said, I want to be tall. So I told myself I was tall. I said, I am beautiful because I realized that I'd never hurt anyone. I'd never done anything wrong to anybody. In fact, I'd done the opposite. I'd gone way out of my way to make them feel good about themselves. So I was goodness inside. I was this energy that I had inside was just pure. Um, and my real name does mean pure, but it's just a boy's name, which is why I don't use it. And I thought, well, what else do you want to be? And I thought, well, don't overload yourself. Just take a few things. But I started progressively to tell myself who I wanted to be. And I unlearned. 50 years, because this happened when I was 50, 50 years of being told a certain thing. And I relearned what I wanted to feel, how I wanted to be, who I was. And I started to discover things. I went to play pool for the first time and I went against somebody who thought he was really good. <laughs> um, I did things like I went temping bowling, hadn't done that. I'd never been to Starbucks and my friend who West Radio once said, I'll take you. So, you know, um, they called in um, the little cups and I just wanted to see my name on there and I was so excited I was jumping around like a little girl and he was like this is embarrassing but for me it was the smallest things that I was finding pleasure in and I still am because I was never allowed to do them and I think as people we forget to actually acknowledge the little things and we forget that we get to decide nobody gets to tell us who we are no one gets to tell you who you are James you decide that yeah. but the other thing is I'm not a social media person never was I obviously follow it now but social media has been bombarding everybody of how to look like Kim Kardashian because that's the idealism of beauty or how to look like, you know, to, to be handsome, you have to have a certain physique or you have to have a certain height or a look. And I never thought anything of those things. And I've realized that people were stuck. I'd never seen false eyelashes till I came to London on a train. And I remember saying to somebody, because I was working as a nanny, I said, I saw this girl, she had really long lashes and I didn't know what to do, but I was staring and I knew I shouldn't be staring. But, you know, it was quite alien to me or I was the alien one or the other. But I realized that my beauty was inside and it was always there. So I was actually lucky because whatever I did on the outside was a bonus. If I wanted to lose weight, I could because it was my choice. And I just discovered that life on the other side of fear was beautiful. It was free. There was freedom. There was love. And it was just a magical place to be. And now I want to literally grab everyone and say, come here, I've got this amazing secret. You know, someone said, what would your ideal job be? And it's, it is and really, if I was a post lady with handing out letters to everyone saying, this is how I see you. But when you read it, you actually read those words and you manifest them, you make them a reality because you've said them out loud. Yeah. And I think that's important for anybody that's struggling. Affirmations are a massive thing. Affirmations would help me change my life. I'd look 30, 40, and I used to go for them every single morning. And I still go for them. I change them every New Year's Eve because it's so important. to You can trick your brain. Your brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake. So if you're getting told your shit, you're not good enough, you're a waster. If you're getting told all that shit, you're going to believe it. And that's the sad reality. And some people don't find strength or don't ever get to that. 50 years old standing in the garden. They, I never, I had it at 30, 
but I, I woke up something just this call it a spiritual awakening but again I always go back to the power of now it can't tell the fucking book saved my life I listened to the other books a boring bastard but I kept falling asleep and it just it made me understand that everything that I was thinking about the past the past brings fear anxiety depression and guilt I was I was stuck there I was stuck in a loop so how did you break the loop because what happens is you do something new consistently neurons in the brain which fire together wire together then create a new pattern and then creates your subconscious mind to then be thinking differently I know all these things do I still practice them every day of course I don't because I'm too caught up more on hype sometimes more podcasts more attention like just stroke my ego because I don't feel good enough today I'll post a photo and people say, oh, you're doing amazing, that's not, I feel good, but it's fake. It's not really love. I feel more alive when I'm doing cold water, I'm in the mountains. Listen, I love my kids. I've got a dog, my dog's, I'm going home. I'll probably drive home tonight or tomorrow morning. I'm, I'm going home for my dog. My kids, will be, I love my kids, but my dog is, the love, I feel pure love with my dog. It just, there's no answering back. It's just, he's got my back. Listen, as much as I love my family, they're fucking pests as well. Hard work, family and relationships and all that and, that's all I've ever wanted was a tight knit family. And when there's arguments or disagreements, it's about communication. Because every, there's no such thing as perfection. We can strive for it. It doesn't exist. Because it's, it's, people need to realise beauty, fame, money. There's never enough. I think often people get stuck in the trap of wanting more, more, more. Yeah. And I'm they don't, stuck in that sometimes. And they don't see what you have now. So if yeah. you become that person like myself, Right now, what I've got, I'm happy with. I strive for more because I want to help more people, but I don't forget to be grateful. Gratitude. Um, it's a huge thing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't be alive. I definitely shouldn't be alive, and I know that. But I remember speaking to somebody that you might know called Leo McKenzie, and he said to me once, I think you trained yourself like this as a young girl. You must have trained yourself to let go because you have this ability just to let go. And I've done that from a young age where I have not held on to things. I don't hate my parents. You know, people don't understand that. I don't hate anybody in my life. I actually love them more because they need that love. I forgave, but I don't forget. You don't forget these things. They hurt you because you've been through them. So how can you forget? But I, would, I will consistently encourage people to let go of things because they're heavy and you get to carry this weight around and you don't need it. You can be light and full of love like me if you just let it go. And it's, it doesn't serve you. The lesson serves you if you take the lesson forward. I've taken so many lessons forward and I look at my life and I think I've got 53 years of lessons. Maybe not the greatest lessons that other people would definitely not maybe make it through, but how could I help the people I'm helping now? How did you learn how to forgive? I forgave as a child. I was very forgiving because I didn't think I deserved anything better. So maybe in that space of low self-esteem, I forgave. And I used to zone out a lot. I was away with the clouds a lot of the time. I, I would read books and take myself to magical places. And I think that was a form of meditation in a way that I was able to do that. Yeah, creativity. Yeah, but I, I've never hated anybody. Even after I left my ex-partner, I wouldn't say anything bad about him until recently. And people know that around me because I just didn't think it was very gracious to say something because it wasn't going to achieve anything. I knew what he'd done. My children knew what he'd done. But why did I need to talk about it? Only until I realized the importance of speaking about domestic violence and some of the things he's done that created this um, almost warped sense of reality that I had because I was so scared all the time that I need to say that because there'll be another woman or a man out there that's also suffering from that. And I've just helped a, a, a guy that lived in Canary Wharf in London who moved thousands of miles away because he was in a very um, dangerous um, relationship, but he didn't see it until somebody from the outside like myself said, that's not normal. Because when you're in it, you don't see it. You know, you've been in relationships, I'm sure, James, where people from the outside have said, that's not a good relationship, but you still carry on doing it. Maybe you feel like you owe it to that person or it's okay for now, or things might change. You know, you get, almost make excuses for bad behavior. But I, I understand the importance of standing in your truth it's a superpower to actually be standing and saying what's happened to you without feeling um, bad for it. Because yeah. we're taught to almost feel bad that we've been through certain things. But everything that's happened has brought me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. So I would never change it. And I can reach out to a young girl that's been attacked or raped or abused. And I can empathize on a different level. I can actually hear her, the unspoken words I can hear. 
when she does a certain gesture, I'll recognize that movement because I was there once. You know, that girl that has maybe survived a non-killing, I, I would recognize that too. And I would, I would understand somebody who's given birth to a son that's passed away because mine did. You know, I, I, I struggle with that still because it's not an easy thing to deal with. But I wouldn't understand it had I not been there. So I see my education as my life. I didn't go to university, <clears throat> but I, I have this amazing ability to be able to help people from what I've learned. How do you, so for honor killings, let's touch on that. Like how bad is it in, for people to get an understanding of actually, actually what goes on with it all? How bad is it in the UK, first of all? Well, I'm, everything happened to me in the UK. You know, when I did go home that day, they'd broken my arm, my jaw. And when I fell down, they stamped on me, um, damaged my hip, but there wasn't literally one piece of skin that wasn't ripped or covered completely in blood from the attack. And it was a really vicious attack. You know, they wanted to kill me. And I remember my father having his foot on my throat really pressing down. And I swear I left my body at that point because I felt nothing. And I remember speaking to myself and saying, that's it now. And I was kind of happy, if I'm being honest. It was kind of like a nice, warm, good feeling. But I remember someone saying, not not yet. And when I did go back, I felt nothing at all. And that happened in the UK, in Leicester. And people say, well, that happened in the in 90s. But not long ago, about seven, eight years ago, my father you know, was in prison because he had abducted my sister. So the mindset doesn't change because they get away with it and they think they're above the law. Or the law actually doesn't do what they should be doing for these people. Like you said, there should be a harsher, harsher sentence, I think, too, for all of these kind of abusive behaviours for them to stop. Otherwise, they continue because they think they can get away with it. What about all around the world? How, how extreme is it? Like, what's the, how many honour killings has there per year, did I say? Well, North Africa has the highest um, number of honour killings statistically. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't believe in statistics because I was never one. Um, and then we have Pakistan, India and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But they are very common and they could be, like I said, over the silliest things. What is known as silly to us. I often have been kicked off Twitter, LinkedIn or social media because I put things on that people don't want to see. You know, why had one guy sent me a message saying, do you have to put such disturbing um, posts on? And I just ignored it because I had put um, a gentleman, um, take that back. I put on a guy holding his wife's severed head. Um, and it was a picture taken because now social media plays a part of, look, look what he's done. He's upheld the honour and he was parading this around the village with blood dripping from, you know, the bottom part of her head because he'd killed her because he felt she had looked at a man. And just a look, you know, I remember my ex-partner saying to me sometimes, you look, you looked at that guy and I'd be thinking, I didn't know there was a guy there. You know, I'm driving. It was like you almost had to tr drive with blinkers on. Um so people take things to the extreme and they are continuing to do it because they teach the younger generation that's the only way forward. Mm -hmm. And until we educate the younger generation to be more compassionate, that's why, where I believe there will be a change to understand how to treat one another, to be more compassionate with themselves too. What do you think that is in men though, the paranoia? Listen, I, I used to do it when I was drinking and you, 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 your, your soul's just dark and your presence is dark. I was always a loud, happy guy, people pleasing, but they never seen me when I was myself and lonely and depressed. And then, but as soon as somebody seen me when I was a big fake smile and I was always the loudest man and as the old saying is the loudest is the weakest and I was weak. But what do you think that is in men? It's not just Indian culture or Pakistan. It's the majority of men. Is that because they don't feel secure in themselves? There's a possessive kind of controlling nature. They call it maybe toxic masculinity. Like, there's so many things you can talk about. But I see it in a lot of men. I seen it in myself. Jealousy and just scared of my fault. My issue was that I was too scared that I wasn't good enough. So that's it. That's it. Would, that's the word. They good would enough. Think they would go with somebody else, so the paranoia kicks in, the jealousy, the possessiveness. But what do you think that is? That no, what you it's think just that. it is? That's it. You hit the nail on the head. Good enough. Mm -hmm. um, most of my clients come forward because they don't feel good enough. And that's like a what, though? As a kid, love or what? That's like a self-belief and self-love. And people think self loves wishy-washy, but it really isn't. It's an empowering thing to love yourself so much that you don't care what anybody thinks of you. I don't care what you think of me in that respect. If you think I'm too fat or maybe too Indian, you know, I've been called too Indian before as well, which makes me laugh. But I've, I've even, I've even in the opposite been called too, too English, you know, um, because of the way I speak apparently, but I don't care. 
I actually don't care. So I'm I'm happy being me completely, 100%. Are there things I want to change about myself? Yeah, a little bit. But I can do something and I am doing something, you know. So I don't use the terminology. I'm, um, I'm, I use the word yet. So I add on the word yet to everything. So I'm not the size I want to be yet. But I don't say that I'm fat because I'm not. I'm, I'm great. I love myself. And if you don't love me for who I am, that's on you, not me. Because mm-hmm. that's something inside you. It's your perception of what beauty or love should be. And I think as a, as a world, we have forgotten how to love. But going back to men, most of my clients come forward because they don't feel good enough. They just don't feel good enough. Um, and they have everybody around them coaching them. They have everybody around them telling them what to eat, telling them they can do this. But when they get in that cage... It's just them. It's you against you, so to speak. So it's overcoming that understanding that believing in yourself, that you are good enough, that you are everything that everyone's told you because they're mirrors of you. And they do put on a show. We have faces, I've written this in my book that I forgot to bring. Ah. <laughs> we have faces for the bank manager. We have faces Definitely for, for faces podcasts. For different places. Yeah. And we yeah. do that because that's what we've been taught. We've mm-hmm. been taught that. But the world does... It's so fast paced. There's so much technology from social media, radio, television. You go back to schooling. The girl I was talking about earlier, listen, everything's wrong, even from the day of birth. As soon as a woman gives birth, she's lying in her back, which is wrong. We're, we're born into artificial light, which is wrong. We cut the umbilical cord again, which is wrong. It's full of stem cells, full of nutrients. We're given a name, we're given a date of birth, we're given a religion. We're given so much from birth. As soon as we enter this earth, it's all fucking backwards. We're given, girls are taking injections for the pain. But again, it's not natural for a kid to come out drugged up. We're given vaccines. We're given so much hmm. from birth is wrong. And you wonder why we're fucked up at 40s and 50s and 60s and teenagers. Because there's so much confusion. We're getting taught sex education at school. Primary schools are teaching it. We've got fucking drag queens reading story times. Leave the fucking kids alone, man. You wouldn't get kids going to strip joints. It's 18 plus for a reason. But for me, it's it's nourishing. It's it's love, but it's hard because everything's competition. I want to be the biggest podcast in the world. So I'm always in competition. I always want to be the See, biggest. I've, the got, I've got a theory. I've got a theory that we're all dead. Mm-hmm. I've said this a few times. People just look at me gone out, but it's fine. It's what I think. It's how mm. I believe. I feel we're all dead and we're sent back here to this game. And this is the game of life. And there's clues all along the way, game of life. Um, and if you stick to the rules, which are the religious texts, the good, be good person, mm. you get to play snakes and ladders, but they're going to throw things in. They throw in filters. People can't take a normal photo without a filter now because they don't like the way they look. Mm-hmm. People's lo- they lowering everyone's self-esteem and their vibrational energy to a point where they don't know who they are and they become those little people that copy, copy, copy. People will not say it's wrong to take drag queens into schools because they don't want the other parents or other people to look at them in a way that, you know, they might not look at them in a way that they feel good about themselves. So they might feel picked on, like we've said before, you become a victim of other people's opinions. You become that target. But I reckon whoever these people are that are playing a game with us, they've put a few people in the mix, like yourself, like me maybe, that have the ability to recognize the wrong and rights to tell the others. And if you were standing at the front of a, a, a large amount of people and I was standing at the back, they would be covered with light. But if you step away, they would see the dark, but they don't see it unless one of us steps away. They think there's always light there. But you and I have worked really hard. We've battled with our demons. We've danced with them to get to where we're going, to get to nearly up those ladders. Mm -hmm. They're still sliding down the snakes and they don't know any different because they believe you should look like Kim. You should have hair extensions. You should put all this makeup on. And they don't know that they don't need it because it's just a bodysuit that's taking us through this game of life. What real life is, is when we're set free from this body and our spirits can literally go from this place to another without even anything blocking it. That's true freedom. And everyone says, well, we are spiritual creatures. Yes, we are. And people say, do you believe in God? I'm God. And the reason I say that is because if God has created everything, and people hate it when I say this, he created this table, this microphone, this jacket, this hair. So I'm an extension of him. So I am God. You are God. But people won't get it because they only hear one part of the story they won't understand where i'm coming from 
But I believe if we all understood and we all kind of woke up and questioned things, which is what we're taught not to do with the subliminal messages continuously coming, 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 like the colours of Ukraine, like the colours of, you know, take your COVID jabs and the rest of it, they're continuously in our faces, but we know it. But if we have to address it and we have to face up to it, then we have to also understand things are not as we see them. And that's an uncomfortable place to be. Knowing about the darkness of human trafficking is uncomfortable for people. They don't want to know that. So the draw, the pretend it doesn't happen. It happened to my sister. So I have to admit to it. I have to do something because I'm not going to be part of a problem. I want to be part of that solution. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? All the shit we go through in life. I took drugs. I sold drugs. I've done a lot of bad, but and then I look at the life now, and I, I used to think that life was cool. I thought it was cool to be sitting in parties for three, four days, fucking high on cocaine and alcohol and being loud and shouting, and I thought that was cool. And my, that was normal for me. And now I look back and it, I don't feel sick. I think I just think how fucking deluded was I? How fucked up in my mind that I thought that was normal to sit in a house party talking shit, talking about saving the world while high on drugs and alcohol, while I was a father, while I had kids. Do you know what I mean? I used to get my kids, get a photo, put it on Facebook and people go, oh, hey, good dad. And I never seen them for four days because I was out partying. But if you were talking about saving the world, even in your subconscious state, you knew there was more to it. A million percent. I used to sit at parties and I think, look at the fucking state of them. I was one of them. But I always knew I had a higher power, I always knew I had higher greatness to be something special. I had it from a very young age, even playing football and everything that I'd done. I always had a gift of something. I was always just the best that without even trying. I had such gifts, but I never worked on my gift, I never worked on the talent. Now I've found a passion, what I'm good at, how I can create stories, how I can create patterns and how I, we can pull a story together from a conversation with no notes. And people go, wow, I was gripped to that because why it's a roller coaster of emotion is to show people that they ain't fucking alone. And that's the, the thing about life. Why do you think we're here, Nina? Oh, I know why I'm here. Why? I, I completely know why I'm here. I've, I'm love. I am li I'm here to show the world that love is the highest form of emotion that you can have. It's the It's wealth. It's actually almost like that winning lottery ticket that you can have. But people, as I said before, the world have forgotten how to love. We cross over the road if someone coughs near us. We just don't extend that love. You know, when I came and you gave me a hug, people don't do that anymore. They don't know how, they think it's weird if a woman and a man actually just show one another emotion. We've kind of switched off to a point we cannot show emotion. We feel it's a weakness. And I've said a thousand times, in my weakest times is when I actually found my strengths. And for me to be able to give that much love to people is is just the start for me. I know that too. You know, with the amount of messages I get, I could play them to you all day long. But I have people saying to me, you know, when we saw your story, we understood that I wasn't alone. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for speaking out against the culture. Thank you. Men saying to me, thank you for being as honest as you are, because it made me realize that I was doing that. I was the perpetrator. And I say to them, well, you're not a perpetrator, actually, you're a criminal. Because if you were to steal your wife's car, you'd be a criminal. If you do that to your wife, you are a criminal. Look at it in a different way. So with my message of hope and love, I know that I'm going to be a catalyst with other people, like I was saying. And when we all come together, I know the world will be a lot better place. So how can things get put in place for changes? Because you know yourself, the voices can be so soft sometimes it's not enough to then create change. It's mad because the people who think they run this world are in control of it there's very few of them the power of the people is standing up and yeah. that's what happens you see things in paris italy and people roaming the streets and, and sticking together and uniting creating change because how are they going to create change same as wars listen wars are murder so people die in murder for what for greed for power and yet we're fucking brainwashed enough to go to wars at 16 and 18. Listen, my great grandparents fought in wars, nothing but love and respect for them. But again, it's it's the conditioning of thinking it's normal. Who yeah. are you fighting for? Who are you fucking fighting for? For what? Mm. Everybody dying, young kids dying for what? For people's greed, for people's power, the destruction in this from viruses. And you can go so deep into life. But what do you think's created us? What do you think as the creator? I know there's gods and there's religions and all that, but how can the heart function, the central nervous system, the spine, our hair grows, our nails, how can we see, smell, touch, feel, taste? That's not, in my opinion, what's, something's created us, whether we're avatars, we're the aliens, or like you say, we're in a game, snakes and ladders, are we coming back, reincarnation, learn your lessons before you go to a better place, because sometimes it feels amazing here. I'll get little bursts of 10, 20 seconds, they'll not last long, I feel fucking amazing. 
and in the mind they go, listen you dickhead, you ain't going to be feeling amazing today and it'll throw in a negative and that negative will ruin my day because it plays in my mind longer than the positive. The less you care about what other people think, the quicker you're going to get to the top of that board game. As a man though, it's difficult. That I feel as if, obviously what you've went through is, there's no words to put in actually what you've went through, but as a man, as the man, I actually, when I was going home from London three weeks ago, I got a train home and the boy said, James English. I said, yes, but I gave him a huddle, cuddle, the boy started fucking crying. I sat with him for an hour and a half. I missed my train, got the next one, started crying. Like you say, a hug, powerful. If you hug somebody for five seconds, you'll feel the energy. How are they? And, and their guard drops instantly. End up speaking to the boy. The boy's still in contact now. And yeah, he's doing good, but men are struggling. We don't know who to turn to. We don't know how to speak. And when we do speak out, nobody's listening. And that, like I said earlier before the podcast, everybody's, a lot of people, more people are speaking out now, but sometimes I feel as if people use it as because it's popular. Oh yeah. And that's the sad thing because if suicide's at an all time high, something's not right. So people can speak out as much as they want, but are we listening enough? Is there enough things in place for men to really open up and understand that you are good enough? You can make changes. But the girl I had on the podcast before you I says a lot of these people struggle with mental health, but a lot of them are drinking, taking drugs, overeating, not exercising. It's gonna fuck with your mental health, even doing one of them, smoking, whatever, pharmaceutical drugs like even tells you in the box in the pharmaceutical boxes like you go you still be suicidal for me over the years i've learned cold water therapy raises the dopamine levels battles with anxiety lowers depression try to eat a bit better which i like i said earlier i struggle with going over affirmations going over goals and the key element for me as well is having purpose i've got a bit of purpose i've got a bit of get up and drive because motivation doesn't exist i can listen to podcasts and motivational videos on youtube and i feel great for 10 minutes but like i say that little negative thought will kick in and i can be lazy but what do you think it is for men just now is why the fuck are we struggling i mean i've been giving free talks around london for three years why free um because it means a lot to me it's mental health i speak about in young men both of my sons have well, my youngest son's just come off the national register for suicide um, high risk suicide register and my other son was self-harming and I didn't even know about it. What was their triggers? Their father because they had watched me being treated really badly for 23 years. My pillow was set alight when I was asleep. And my youngest son became homeless with me because of um, an attempted murder. And this is a, another husband or the same one? No because what happened is after the honour killing I ended up going back to my friends that I'd met at the um, office so to mm -hmm. speak um, and he split up with his girlfriend and I ended up getting a, an, a, I ended up renting a room from him. He ended up raping me, got me um, drunk. I never drank before in my life and I ended up having a daughter. But in my culture, mentally, I was, I was programmed, you stay with whoever you've had a child with. So I stayed with him for 23 years and I ended up having four children. One of them died um, because of his, um, the way he treated me. But the other three are here and amazing children. Were you pregnant? I was pregnant. I was um, eight months pregnant, just, just coming up to full term. And he pushed me down the stairs. Um, and when I got to the hospital, um, he'd left me. And when I did get to the hospital, um, he, um, Tyler died at birth. There's my little boy. But I know that he's around me. I know that all the time, that he's around me. Yeah. Um, but it's one of the hardest things I've had to deal with and I've had to deal with a lot, but that's just something that I won't wish upon anyone. And who was this guy? What's his culture? He was Nigerian. Um, it wasn't a love marriage. It wasn't, we weren't in love. We never dated. We didn't really, I didn't understand about relationships. And this is the problem. If you come from a culture like mine, you don't understand that someone's supposed to wine and dine you and look after you and take care of you and yeah. ask you how you are and cook for you. Even sometimes you think you're this, you're subservient to them. So you're literally doing everything that for them. But I was an entrepreneur. I had created a lot of wealth. And with that, sometimes there's that greed, isn't there, that comes along. And he was very greedy. Um, he wanted more and more and more. So the more he wanted, I would do more within terms of business. But cut a long story short, he tried to kill us. And my children struggled because they didn't understand why their father, A, would want to try and kill their own, his own. 
And just the way he was, it was a very controlling scenario. We weren't allowed to have friends. Our car was tracked. The children couldn't have um, play dates. They played professional football. They were in academy for West Brom. Um, my elders had trials for Barcelona. They both got into Barcelona. They weren't allowed to go. There was a lot going on, you know, but it was a case of not being allowed to do it. But the boys just didn't understand and they couldn't deal with it. Um, but as I said, from my experience, when I decided my youngest wouldn't be on the drugs, when he wouldn't be harassed by people asking him questions that weren't really leading anywhere, I left him alone. And I think when you shut off the world to a certain point, and it's the negative voices, that's what you need to do. If someone out there is struggling, especially a male, they have to get rid of those negative voices that are still around them to get rid of them. And we can be toxic. Even I can be toxic. And I know it sometimes. We all have that within us. But to get rid of that person that's continuously toxic in their life is a fresh a breath air. It's a case of, you know, freeing your mind. And then you have to work on the past. You don't have control of that. You know that yourself. You've, you're not there anymore. You're here. You're right here with me. But you're still sometimes going back there and forth and you're playing this game almost in yourself of back and forth. It's like a to and fro thing. But you get to decide. You get to decide. You, James gets to decide today. I'm going to stay here. I'm not that person, but that person taught me so much. I've got that wealth of knowledge now. And, you know, finding a purpose, like you said, is a huge thing. I gave my youngest son a purpose. I said, look, I'm going to go into property. I want you to help me. This is what I want you to do. He was on it. He was reading everything. He'd gone from playing games, which I don't like, then mind numbing, to actually reading. And reading is huge. It takes you away. It's an escape in a way. And, and like you said, you know, the cold water therapy, everyone's different. So what might be good for me might not be good for you. Mm -hmm. I do believe in psychedelics to a certain degree. I haven't taken them myself. But my elder son, um, the middle child, he has taken some and it helps him. And I think they tell you they're bad for you because actually they know they're good for you Yeah. in certain controlled environments. You know, I think that's the key is having, I had an ayahuasca four years ago, but I'm a control freak. I fought against that. They kept telling me to surrender. I'm thinking, I ain't fucking surrendering. I'm fighting this fucker. Like, that's what I, all I've done since the day I was born was fight, angry. Not what I, I was a good kid, man. Just guided wrong. My mum and dad loved me, man. Like they're great people. And the more I've got older, the more I realise how much they actually done from that rough area where I'm from. There's a place called Porso, and it's one of the most deprived areas in the UK. And but there's so many great people there. They're all fucking lunatics, prison, violence. But it was normal then. It just that was a way of life. And obviously, when you get older and you start having to digest everything and understanding that, all right, I've got a wee bit fucked up past, but I can be okay. And, I went to Costa Rica and did this plant medicine. I bought into it because we're all wanting, I feel as if it can be very culty as well. So people need to be aware. Oh yeah. It can be very culty. A lot of people use their spiritual energy as, as if they're gods and there's more abuse and more shit happens there. So I don't mm -hmm. want to, I don't want to be a faker. I don't want to, because I've been offered to sell fucking Bitcoin and promote this CBD and this and that. Yeah. For me, everything's internal because you can get to a higher state without ayahuasca, without fucking MDMA, without alcohol, cigarettes. The only thing it takes you to a higher state than that is meditation. Meditation is a key for all the fucking pain. If yeah. you sit in your own mind, five minutes before bed, five minutes when you get up, the most crucial points of your life is the first hour and the last hour. It's your most creative. That's the first thing I do with my clients. Yeah, I teach important. them this real um, easy kind of guided meditation. Yeah. Sometimes I record it for them as well. Mm -hmm. And it's that escape. You get to decide where you want to go today. So where do you want to go? I'm going to give you three doors. So you choose what's on the other side of the door. And it's almost like taking them into a place that they deserve. And they have to learn to, to believe they deserve it. Mm -hmm. I deserve the life that I'm building. I deserve it and more. Yeah. And that's not arrogance. There's a difference between arrogance. I could sit in designer clothes and think very little of myself. So I choose to decide what I want to wear for me, mm -hmm. not for you to judge me. And when you get to that point, it really does free you. And for men, I think it's harder because you're seen as the alpha. You're seen as the person that's supposed to have it all under control. And and it's easy to get lost. It's easy to get lost and, and keep faking it to the people that you're looking after, that you're, yeah. you know, you want to sort of be that role model for. But when you do switch and you find it, that complete self-love, it's a very calming place to be. 
Mm-hmm. It's exceptionally calming. It's just giving in. And you said control. You want to be in control because you're scared of what's on the other side of not yeah. being in control. But if you were to allow yourself, if you allowed yourself just to be, you would find such peace. Yeah. The such thing peace. is, because everything I've done has got me this far, and it's an element of being vulnerable. And it's scary because I know how ruthless it is outside these doors. And I don't want to be show vulnerability. Vulnerability is key. My kids will see me vulnerable. My dog will see me vulnerable. The, the people who love me will see me vulnerable. And, but you'll never see me crying in front of you. But you'll see me cry alone if there's fucking cameras in my room or whatever. But you'll never see me because it's. I've just got to get on with it. Everything I've created, I've created through vision, hard work, belief. Nobody fucking funded me. Nobody backed me. They all laughed at me at the start. Nobody knew what a podcast was in Scotland five years ago. I just had a, a, such a drive of... I need to focus on to something because when you're gambling and taking drugs and womanizing and everything that I was doing externally to fill an emptiness in me, I needed to fill the void because I was lost. I'm still lost. I still don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I just know what I'm doing now is working. I know I've got plans and visions and I'll, I'll come up with goals and I'll write down my affirmations. I'll write down my goals. And every New Year's Eve, I'll go over my goals from the year before. And the majority of them, 60, 70% of them are hit. But it's unbelievable if writing stuff down and goes down how actually it becomes clear. I think mm. it's 50% or 60% more clearer in the mind. But like I say, I'm still, I am still don't know what the fuck is going on. And that's the beautiful thing about life. I just know what I'm doing is the right reasons. But you keep using the word, I did this, I've done this, mm-hmm. me. It's never been about you. Who's that about? It's just about us. We are all one. You know, you're an extension of me. I'm an extension of you. I'm here because of you. Mm-hmm. I'm. You're here because I, you've invited me, but we're here because of one another. And when you stop seeing the outer as not part of you, it just brings it all together. Mm-hmm. It brings everything together that you understand that this whole thing is for you primarily, but you don't have to fight it because it's there for you already. You just need to take it. You need to accept yeah. it. It was the word surrender I didn't like as well. Surrender f- to me is, feels like defeat. You know what I mean? Words are so powerful, but yeah. you know that already. The words are the, the most powerful thing that we can discuss and talk about because we speak things into existence. You think the, the world doesn't know if you're joking. And I, I've got quite dark humour. I'm always making jokes, but I, I realised I was making jokes. And I would say, oh, I just I want to have a laugh, but I was doing it to deflect. I was in pain. Do you know what I mean? It's difficult because I still swear, I still wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm still passionate about certain things. I get it wrong sometimes. I still get angry. I still get pissed off. Somebody cuts me off the road, I think. And I cringe. Why am I getting angry? Like they've just stole my power. And Mike Tyson says it. And somebody was talking to him and he says, oh, I had somebody on his podcast and the kid was saying, if people are doing me wrong, I just cut them off. Mike Tyson says, why? He says, because I just, I don't want negative people in my life. He says, but then they've, they own you. And he says, why? He says, because they've changed you. Yeah. Because you've allowed them that. Mm. And that was powerful. How did you get, how did you end up getting away from the other marriage then? Like it's, I'm laughing because it's fucking. It's yeah, there's a lot more to my story. We've that. not covered it really. But, um, well, I, I was taken away by social services and then, given a a place to live which was really disgusting because it had human feces smeared everywhere but that was my safe house apparently um but I wasn't allowed to stay there because on paper I was a millionaire which I was because I had a lot of property I had several businesses running but I had not a penny to my name and I'd left with nothing just a coat um and the system let me down the system let me down I'd paid into the system so much so that I was let down so I had nothing so I became homeless with my youngest son And then a lady, as I said, offered me a place to stay and I moved away. I had to move away. And when I did, I rediscovered me. And when I discovered me, I, everything just seemed to fall into place. You know, I understood there's no difference between you and I, and I'm in the right places all the time because that's how my life is. I stood, I think in Canary Wharf it was, and a whole load of people came around the corner. They were UFC fighters. I don't know who they were. I was trying to get out of a fire engine because I'd climbed in because, you know, I'd had a few drinks and I'm playing this um, youthful person that I didn't have a chance to be. And I just wanted to be in the fire engine. And the person that took me out was um, one of the heavyweight champions of the world. And he took me out, put me down and we started talking. And I spent from 7 p.m. that night until 11 a.m. with about 15 of these fighters just talking. And I was listening more than I was talking. But the little I would say was a value. I don't believe in just talking for the sake of it. A lot of people do that because they're deflecting, as you said earlier, from how they're feeling. But if I'm listening to what you're really asking me and 
sharing what I feel. Because a lot of coaches, because there's a lot of life coaches out there, there's millions, they don't tell you really what to do. They almost play a game with you. And I find it frustrating. When people come to me, they come to me in a lot of mental pain. And these are big guys, but they're in so much mental pain. If I was to just ignore that and not give them any love, then I'm not me. So I will give them options. This is what you can do, or this is what you can do, or this is what, what would you like? How, what's going to help you out of these things I've suggested? And that's what I was doing all night. And then one of them kept talking to me, he was at France at the time. And he said to me, I'm going to America soon. I've been signed up as well, blah, blah, blah. And then it got to a point where he was winning a lot of his fights within seconds of actually getting into the cage. Um, and then he ended up employing me because I said, I can't keep doing this for free. I've got, I've got to find a job or something. And he said, I know I will pay you. And he paid me a huge amount. And I thought, this is what I'm worth because he's my mirror. He sees my value, even if I didn't. Because we find it hard to ask for money sometimes, which is difficult for people. But you have to learn that if you don't ask, you don't get. A value you're worth. And also, yeah, it's keeping that process of give and take going. Mm -hmm. You give me something and you take something. It's an energy currency. It is. Mm -hmm. and, and if we block it, block it, block it, that's when we cannot get further with what we're trying to achieve. And some of my clients are like, but I brought this thing out, it's not selling. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's see why it's not selling. Mm -hmm. What well, if you figured out with men that, like I say, UFC fighters, I know a lot of boxers are just broken inside the constant try to compete like combat sports is ruthless ruthless to it's it's not bar, well, barbaric in a way yes possibly but as men as well competition is good i believe it's healthy but we're just living in a society but then I, again i watched a video and the man was says feed them bread and water and they don't ask real questions because we'll sit in sports events and people football is all people have in their life as well and that's kind of sad because there's a lot more to it but people can just be fo so focused on something that doesn't really benefit their life even for that small sink that might for the goal scorer but they're constantly looking for new signings new players and injuries and results and it's constant they've not got enough time to then concentrate on themselves but like, i understand everything as a sport as a game i watch it i'm part i played football for years i love it yeah. but it doesn't fulfill me like i, I just listen okay i'll maybe look at the result and then that's that, I'm done. But it, you can be brainwashed by sports as well. Why do actors get paid the most sports stars as well? Because they can, they're making people, I wouldn't say busy, but they're, it's dumbing, not dumbing them down, but it's keeping them occupied from what's really going on in the world. There's a lot more shit that we should be looking into. Oh, yeah, like, definitely. You look at golfers and NBA stars are getting paid mm. Ronaldo, I think, 400, 500 million a year. Should one person be getting that? I mm. get that you've got to value your worth, but look at the the homeless situation, the abuse, the suicide. Like we could be doing a lot more as individuals. No doubt these people do so much for charity, and I'm not just trying to pick one person out, but I feel as if there should be a lot more things that we could be discussing and focusing on. But again, that's just the way the world works. But what if you've seen in men where you found a connection that really makes them see the world differently I, I go back to the beginning with them I always do because it, with my own experience I come from a place of learnt behaviour of myself mm -hmm. so often you forget what you had to do to become that footballer you know you forget that journey and a lot of people only see your end result oh James is doing amazingly now look at him he's, he's doing great Nina Nina's been Scott how does she get to be that public speaker that she is she's done great but they haven't seen the journey and often with sports people I respect them so much I always have done it's the journey that actually makes you as a person but you forget that so you're cutting weight you're you know you're training um seven times a week you're making sure you've got the right diet you're getting enough sleep you're hitting the gym enough times and then you have the fight and you win and then what they can't even celebrate their win because suddenly there's an emptiness that win lasts them that celebration lasts them maybe 10 minutes then they sit back in their changing room and they don't really know what to do because they've been hype 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 but they forget about their own journey and it's acknowledging your journey acknowledging what you have gone through to get to that place and having that gratitude that we talked about yeah. that gratitude keeps you um sane to a certain degree it keeps mm. you balanced there's a balance because otherwise it's very there's there's no balance you've got to bring it back down and say to you right that's great i i'm going to give myself self-care because i deserve it mm -hmm. i've just 
been really battling with my own weight even because cutting weight cut, when they have to cut weight it's really difficult for them mm-hmm. I've been with people where they've cut weight they're really weak they go to get weighed up and then they're still not feeling right and I don't think it's very healthy either mm-hmm. but it's just for them to acknowledge that they have been through that process to sort of say to themselves all right I'm really going to sit down and acknowledge it on that day I felt really bad but now I've won and to celebrate themselves because they don't celebrate themselves they're then told if you don't do this you're going to lose it yeah you've got to stay on it so you've got to stay on it yeah that's the that's the thing about combat sports and that's why you see boxers coming back at 50 because there's something missing but it's not really it's just that reward system the dopamine levels have just skyrocketed when you're walking in to a fight after that i remember i had a boxing fight nearly two years ago in manchester in front of thousands of people first fight i always like to test myself and uh I didn't enjoy it until obviously after winning, but then again it was a couple of minutes, and then I went back to the hotel room yeah. myself. I don't drink, so everybody was out partying, and I kind of not emotional, but just thinking, "That's it, done. What's what next? now?" Yeah. yeah, and I ain't a fighter. That's I, a common thing. Yeah, I can handle myself, but I'm not a combat when I'm give my whole life to it. But I just thought, fucking hell, look what an overload. What where does a dump go? Do you know you what see, I mean? You see, to move forward from any trauma, you have to really acknowledge it, as in you have to say it out loud. Mm-hmm. You have to go back to that deep darkness because we have a habit of pushing things aside um, or we shrink them and pretend they're not as bad as they are. And I did that a lot with the rape. I didn't admit it until not that long ago, two years ago, I think it was, I admitted mm-hmm. it to my best friend. And I pretended it didn't happen because it was easier to deal with. But to overcome the trauma, especially for men, whatever's bothering them, they really have to acknowledge it. Whether they messed up in a relationship, whether they're not at the place they want to be, they have to actually say to themselves out loud, okay, I acknowledge that I messed up. Mm-hmm. And how it feels, they have to acknowledge and actually listen to themselves of how they're feeling. Not, they don't have to have a conversation with anyone. They don't need to lie about it or fake it and make it better Mm -hmm. than it is they just need to be truthful with themselves when you do that then you can move forward slowly it's a slow process but that's the only way you can move forward yeah that's the thing about trauma or pain like i says earlier that you either become make it either makes you a villain or a hero and the same thing when there's clouds coming like everybody's got different levels of trauma and pain but you look at the cows and the bulls the first thing when a storm comes the cows what do they do they run away they run away and hide but what does a bull do? The bull runs towards the storm because I know if they run towards the storm, it won't last as long. Same as your trauma and pain, unless you face it, you ain't going to fucking heal it. You've got to face it to heal. You You've got to it's help put it face. And it's so painful. Like it you is. say, it's easier to suppress it. But 40 years later, 50 years later, it's always going to come ahead. But that's why I think so many men are feeling the way they are. And Suppressing also it's the it. lack of support. I don't think men are supported as much as they need. People think they can do it without the support. You know, I'm thinking back to some of my clients and they've lost parents or they've lost a partner and they feel, you know, or they are surrounded by fake people. They lack that support and that's the trust that you came to before. You know, I trust my judgment now when I don't feel right in a place, I'll leave, I don't need to explain. Yeah. Often I'll go places and I'll just stand on my own. I'm, I'm happy in my own company. And someone the other day said to me, I went to an event and they said to me, oh, hi. And they were quite aggressive and they were people from my culture. And it was a male and I said, can you just leave my space, please? I don't feel bad about saying it. I don't feel I had an attitude. He probably did. And, and he moved away. He didn't understand me. And he said something to somebody else. And they were like, oh, that's Nina, though. <laughs> you can't say that to Nina. It's Nina, you know. And I was quite happy doing my own thing. Yeah, you've got to protect your own space. Same as like, I got offered to go to events and stuff. I just don't go. People say, oh, he's changed this and that. You're fucking right. I have changed. I value me. But I value more men energy. need to do that. Yeah, and I just, I ain't get time for, I don't mind being around people if they're having a couple of drinks, I don't mind that. But it's once they get past that two drinks, they, mm. they become more in your face, they become more personal and ask daft shit that they wouldn't ask when they're sober. But yet, I'll walk anywhere with my head held tight. Any fucking where I'll go into rooms. Like here today, I'm here myself. I'll go into ho- houses in Belfast or go and do podcasts in Liverpool, Manchester, some criminals. And I'll sit myself. Some of the rooms are five people, ten people, but my presence and my energy, I always feel spiritually connected anyway. Nobody's ever going to say anything or try anything because I'm not there to harm anybody. But I am always go confident and it's sad because the people who drink alcohol they always think they've got that extra but as after the the big show but you speak to that person the next day or alone or when they're sober and you'll see a totally different person you'll see a vulnerable person kind of scared and listen what about with the alcohol thing when did you start drinking 
Oh, well, my first experience of drink was when my ex-partner got me drunk. Um, and then I ended up having my daughter because he raped me. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a big drinker. I did go through a bout of drinking, admittedly, but it was to it's forget escape, things. Man. It's a good escape. I did. I, I remember escape. it when things were really tough and I just moved into my home. Mm -hmm. I actually started to realize what had happened in my life. It was like a realization. A lot has happened. You know, a lot of trauma had happened. And sometimes I would drink just to not feel like you said earlier. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's the, um, a calming place. Yeah. But I've always been a meditator. I've always meditated. And I, I don't drink as much. Maybe I do on occasions. But meditation for me is crucial. Every night mm -hmm. I unpack which a lot of people don't do. They just lie down yeah. and they try to fall asleep. But every night I have this, this system where I physically see myself coming downstairs with a bin bag full of the things that I didn't particularly like mm -hmm. that day. And I tie the bin up and I pick pick the bin lid up and I throw it in the dustbin outside. And then I go back up the stairs and I physically see myself doing this. And then I'm in my bed and then I'm calm. And then I think of the nice things, the sunshine, the green bird that I saw flying by. What was it? You know, and I speak to myself, I always had this thing. And I think that actually is a really good way of clearing everything from the day and starting a new, a fresh day. Mm -hmm. And most days, I would say it's five out of seven days, I jump out of bed and I say, yes, I do. I'm really happy. I get up and I'm like excited. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be that I'm going anywhere or seeing anyone. Obviously, I'm a real person, so I get emotional when some things have affected me too, like family, my children. <laughs> you know, they they tend to affect me a lot. They're fucking hard. Man, <laughs> they are. Got be, it's not like, easy being a parent. doesn't matter how much you work on yourself or how in tune you are. No. My daughter riles me up the most <laughs> because she's the only girl to ever have me wrapped around her finger. I know, I see it, and that's okay, man, but I try and be strict. I'm a strict, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, I'm a strict father Yeah. because oh, I'm so protective. I always have been with everybody in my family. I'm a protective it's, it's instinct. I keep saying I'm going to write a book called How I Fuck My Kid's Life Up yeah. because I think I will because I did. You know, no one teaches you how to be a parent. Nah, and even when you try your best, there's something yeah. that's just not good enough. Yeah. So I don't beat myself up anymore with them. I know I'm doing my best, but they can affect me emotionally. They're the only ones that can do that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, nobody else can really affect my mood or how I feel. Mm -hmm. I'm normally on a a 10 out of 1 to 10. I'm normally there. But that's because I choose to be. When are you at your happiest? Um, I suppose when I'm with my kids. When are you at your loneliest? I'm never lonely. When I, does that hit you though? Because we all have bad days, no matter how much we work I, I feel, I f when I get a message come through, and I've had a lot of messages come through recently, you know, from people that need help. Mm -hmm. Last Sunday it was a low point because I had a, a nine-year-old girl sitting on my knee that had been trafficked. She had been sold, well, no, her, she had like a distant aunt that had brought her from Nigeria to Italy, sold her into prostitution, and then somehow somebody in a hospital had helped her get to the UK, and she is now with a foster family. She was sitting on my knee. That was heavy, because I saw my own sister. I saw mm. lots of other girls, and I feel helpless sometimes. So sometimes I do get that feeling of not being able to do enough quick enough, but I feel I'm a real person. I feel someone else's pain so much. It's almost, you know, it really sort of tears me apart. Yeah, an empath. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't really like terms or, you yeah. know, labels. I don't yeah. like that. But I have a heart. I have a pure heart. And I feel that. So that was probably one of my lowest points, just because I couldn't sort things out for her. Mm -hmm. But that aspires me, though, to make more money. Because when I make more money, I can help more people. So I'm not trying to make money so I can have designer handbags. I really don't care about them because a lot of them are made by people that are blood money, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not into that. What I'm into is giving and helping as much as I can. Because as I keep saying, my I'm a Sikh. Um, my parents are not practicing Sikhs, admittedly. A lot of the religious institutions are run by people who think culturally not the actual religion. Mm -hmm. But the nice part of Sikhism is about love yeah like the six police i says that yeah well because i know they do a lot for the homeless i worked in birmingham for a bit and the work that they done religiously it was not just going out once a week every day morning and night it's called it, we have a word it's called seva which means mm. to be of service mm -hmm. and that's why i think i believe i should be of, not should i just it's the way of life for me to be of service to others yeah how does it sitting here today kind of going over a lot of things that like, does it bring back a lot of emotion because the brain will repeat like I said earlier, the brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake. So whatever you think about whether the emotion was 10, 20 years ago, it releases a chemical to the pain and the emotion you'd felt that day. That's how powerful the brain is. Like, how does it go through everything today? 
I've actually been really good today. Good. And I know my bodyguard's sitting over there thinking she hasn't cried as much. Because sometimes I'm just, I'm just very tearful. It hurts. You know, it hurts to know that the person that was supposed to teach me to ride a bike didn't do that. He raped me. He hurt me. He didn't protect me. But then I say that he taught me how to love. He taught me to love unconditionally. So I'd rather take that lesson and that life skill from it. But it hurts me. You know, I was once that victim. Yes, I'm a survivor now. But once I was there, once I was that helpless girl, and sometimes I look back at my own pictures and I don't understand it. You know, I, I have empathy. I have that hurt for her, my inner child. But I know that she, if I could go back to her, I wouldn't change anything for her. I would just tell her that eventually it's going to be all right just to, just to be strong. What about any girls that's watching that's maybe been going through that struggle? I don't know. You don't know who's going to be watching this or listening to this. Yeah. So what advice would you have for them? How do they get help? How do they reach out? Because like you say, they're so programmed as well to think they're disrespecting their whole family and beliefs, but it's wrong to be raped. It's wrong to be abused. It's wrong to be getting beaten. Like, what advice would you have for these yeah, people? Yeah, I mean, even on the way here on, on public transport that I took, there were two girls discussing whether the person that had beaten his partner was right to beat her because maybe there was mitigating circumstances that caused him to do that maybe he'd noticed you know that in his childhood so he was that now that abuser there is no there's no right reason for it um if you are in a situation like that fear is so powerful it takes away your ability to think i have a non-profit called end honor killings which i'm hopefully you'll put the link on which is open to anybody i'm not you know only doing this for women it's for men women anybody um i have resources for legal aid i can you know i work with other non-profits and together i believe that we can make a change you know people have the power as you said earlier so if anyone's struggling out there and they just want to offload they can i have a group that i have um i, I provide free mindset coaching to every month or every six weeks depending on my availability because i believe if i can help them to think differently then they will free themselves and not just themselves, their children, and they'll pass that on. And, and then in six months or a year's time or three years time, whatever the time period is, they'll be the people sitting there helping other people. So I'm creating this movement. That's what I'm creating. So I want that change. Yeah. But you're on the right path and things that you're doing. Look how far you've come. This is only the beginning of creating change. I'm going to say, oh, I want to create change. But first of all, I've still got a, a few things I still need to work on myself to then, not be the finished article, but to keep learning and educating and understanding. I don't have all the answers. Sometimes I think I know everything. Sometimes I think I can save the world. But sometimes, and I said this before, but sometimes I actually do talk and I think, James, you're really on it. You really do know what you're talking about. Then I listen back and I think, nah, you're just a fucking psychopath. You're trying to pretend. And that's okay to pretend, but... I just want to be as true as I can be. End of the day, I'm still out for myself. I've still got a business to run. I still want to show people how to create a better life and not necessarily money makes you who you are. But you can, if you're a good person, you can enjoy your freedom. You can enjoy the finer things in life if you're not being too over arrogant or too poisonous, if you know what I mean. A lot of people out there think success and money and fame it defines them but it's, it's it's an illusion no i respect that because you're not being fake you know you're being completely honest yeah, I like nice things i want i want my farmhouse i want my animals i want the loving family and the dogs and mm. everybody i always visualize the barbecues i'm a provider i'll provide and protect i want to homeschool my kids i want to the, the loving missus who's the good meals and the cooking i'm not saying don't do this don't do that because i'm not i'm not saying don't drink and being i don't drink I'll go work, I'll go protect and I'll come home for, and just want family time. I don't want the phones after five o'clock. Mm. I want to read for an hour before and I'll go over affirmations that I've, we're on this path and this is the things that I've created and that's everything. It took me 39 years, but well, I'm getting there. So everything I know that I've done in the past to what I'm doing now, I've still got things I can work on. I can still overwork, be a bit aggressive sometimes, but it's, it's served me well this far. I think, you see, I'm sometimes tough on myself and I say, you know, I have to remind myself I was homeless literally six and a half years ago. I had nothing, not a penny, not even mm -hmm. clothes, nothing. Um, but I sometimes feel I should have been a lot further than I am right now. But I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm I'm full of this immense love. And I've never had that before, not from anyone, because I was looking from it for it from my parents or from my partner or from someone 
whereas it never really existed anywhere else other than within me. And it just took that minute to understand that it comes from within you. And then you do attract those people. I get 40, uh, roughly 30 to 40 death threats every month. But I get, I also get five or six, um, you know, proposals, which wow. makes me laugh. Yeah. So it's just that case of, you know, you, you attract it if you want it. But it's, it's you've got to start with yourself. Yeah. You really do. The thing is, man, with these death threats, now, these are weak individuals. A, I call them keyboard warriors, yeah. but then, but then, having said this, and I'm not told anyone this, I went to an award ceremony the other day, and I won Woman of the Year in mm. Parliament, which was something. Congratulations! Um, thank you. Well yeah. I still have to celebrate that. I haven't got around to it, but there was a woman that followed me around that day, and you know when you get that inner feeling, yeah. as I said, that gut feeling, and she followed me into the toilet to tell me that the cartel know who I am. And I realized very quickly after just walking out that, hold on, did she just say that to me? And yeah, she was doing a lot of um, Masonic signs and things on my table, but I wasn't catching on. And then later on, I realized, yeah, okay, because she sent me a, no, a nice message via Instagram, encrypted, but I know exactly what she's saying, that we're watching you because the cartel is very much involved with human trafficking. It's a business for them. They don't want me to be talking about it. So there are a lot of big people a lot of powerful people to themselves that think they can harm somebody like myself but i'm just one of many and i believe i'm protected yeah, you're well protected and the thing is people think the gangsters are the people who aren't of you the man with a scar on his face or maybe done 20 30 years in prison the real gangsters are sitting in parliament with the suits on definitely making trillions pharmaceutical industry traffic and i'm not saying everybody in parliament there must be people who start off and they're trying to do good there's people in there trying to make change but you go down the route and you start asking a question where's it all connected to what families is it connected to and they kind of see it all leaves clues and like i don't have all the answers to it i'm not in it to know it but i read enough and i educate myself on enough and a few things and i speak to a lot of high power for a lot of high people high rank people on this planet where you can't get enough knowledge and information to go okay this world does control them if you speak out and you're losing them money of course they'll just take off the numbers it's easier yeah the same as the trafficking it's such a it's a billion dollar industry definitely you like you can buy a kid for like you say two goats a dollar two dollars and they're getting their heart cut out their liver their kidneys that are getting sold for hundreds of thousands in the, the, the black market where do you go forward for the future, Nina? Like, what's the plans? So my plans are eventually I'll have a farmhouse, but my farmhouse will be a refuge for people, literally for me to take them in, because I just feel I'm full of love, um, and I want to extend that to them as well, because I never had it for them to bring their children. But I see the future not just for myself, it's the community that I'm building, the movement, as I said, I'm building, so that we can all go forward, because I don't think it's just a one-person thing. So bringing other people forward, and we're not all on the same time timelines. You know, you said to me, you're not quite there yet. I found myself when I was 50, you know, so my timeline would have never happened when I was 20, but eventually we'll all catch up with each other mm -hmm. and we'll be that light that people need, as they say, or whatever it is, you, however you want to describe it. But I just know I've got so much more to do. It's little things, like one of my clients, he's um, um, Owen Roddy, you might have heard of him, he's Conor McGregor's strike coach. He does his affirmations. He said he didn't have time. Now he does his affirmations. He didn't have time to see his girls either. He's such a great dad. Now he does them in the car, dropping them to school with the girls. And what a great gift that is. And they're now taking it forward. So those girls that he's got in the car saying the same affirmations, they're going to take it forward and forward and start that process of change. That's that domino effect. Yeah, pay it forward. Exactly. Yeah. So for me, for me, little things are happening all the time and I know they're all coming together, but yeah. I, I do see myself as leading a huge movement of change. Yeah, go on. Yeah, I see that as well. What about your book? Like, what's that about? So I wrote a self-help book last year mm. called Master Your Life, Live the Life of Your Dreams, just because of all the mistakes I had made with money, relationships, family. Um, I did a bit about COVID just to question things, you know, ask, you ask yourself a question. Health and fitness, because the healthier I am, the better I feel, the better I can do things things more I can do. So it was really all of my life skills put into one, the common questions I get from men, a lot of them. Um, and I put it all into one just as a self-help book. Yeah, it's a bestseller. Can, can you buy <laughs> so you can get it from Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. All my website takes you to Amazon. Yeah. Listen, Nina, for coming on today and telling your story, listen, it's been unbelievable. Very proud of you, how far you've come. You're a beautiful woman who's doing yourself justice from the pain that you've learnt from and keep growing from and try to do well in the world. And that's all we can do is 
just try and be better than the fucking who we were yesterday. But again, there's so much distractions all there. We can be distracted with so many things, but it's about staying in the past, staying true to you. We ever not going to figure it all out? Maybe not, but all we can do is try. For anybody that's maybe caught in a rut or too scared to speak out, male or female, what advice would you have for them? Um, I would say speaking is a huge thing. It's a release. If you can't tell somebody as you are, then be anonymous about it. Um, but I would also say, if you know somebody who's struggling, go to them. Because often through helping someone else, we heal. And that's a great way of doing it also. But you've got to speak about it. So you have to create a change to have a different reaction to what, you know, you've got to create something. So I say to people, do something today. Don't wait till tomorrow because we know it doesn't really, it's just going to prolong the pain. Um, and I just want everyone out there to know that they do deserve love that they are doing the best that they can be doing with what they have. And that if they feel that they're inadequate or they're not doing enough, just to give themselves a bit of a break. Nina, wish you all the best for the future. Thank you again. God bless you and take care. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.